Hi, uh, can, you, can everyone hear me? Good, I wasn't sure if my microphone was switched on. Um, thank you very much for coming. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the effect of light on our minds and our bodies. Um, I'll just check, yeah, we're okay, good. So if you ever need a reminder of the awesome power of the sun, the Mojave Desert in the southwest U.S. state of Nevada is a very good place to start. In summertime, the daytime temperature frequently hits 49 degrees centigrade, and stepping outside is literally like walking into a giant furnace. The local flora and fauna arm themselves against this intense heat. Joshua trees grow these tough, concave spikes for leaves, channeling what little water does fall down towards their roots. Animals like rattlesnakes and coyotes um, only emerge after, after dark or at dawn and dusk, so they're crepuscular. Um, they, and then you have desert tortoises that burrow down into the sand to escape the whole summer. Um, <laughs> humans are less well equipped. So just to the south of this desert is the Sonora Desert. And every year, hundreds of Mexican and um, Latin American migrants meet their deaths while trying to cross into the US. The sun strips away their body fluids and causes them to overheat. Our ancestors revered the sun as this creator and destroyer of life. Just to the, uh, just to the east of this desert is um, Chaco Canyon, where Native American Indians constructed this, this kind of um, calendar, where it consists of these three giant rock slabs and at kind of key turning points of the year, so in particular the winter solstice and the summer solstice, you get sunlight penetrating down in the cracks between these rock slabs and alighting on this kind of pecked solar, solar imagery um, to kind of tell, tell the time of year. Um, and this kind of this similar imagery of light penetrating the darkness at key turning points of the year is found all over the world in, in civilizations thousands of miles and, and indeed years apart, um, from Machu Picchu in Peru to Stonehenge in um, southern England and Newgrange in Ireland. So our ancestors, you know, the, the ancestors revered this relationship with the sun, but today we've largely lost this connection. This is Las Vegas, also rising out of that desert landscape, as if in defiance. Um, at night, the Las Vegas Strip is the brightest place on Earth, and the brightest source of artificial light on the planet, in fact, emanates from the tip of the Luxor Resort and Casino, which is this vast pyramid-shaped building which like, issues this beam up into the sky called the sky beam each night. Um, local air, aeroplane pilots are, are kind of forewarned of this because it can kind of throw them off. But you can see it if you fly over the desert at night, you can see this beam of light. It's almost like it's issuing this direct challenge to the sun. Because Las Vegas has tipped our traditional relationship with light and dark on its head. And it's an extreme example of what we do every day of our lives in the modern world. So about 15 years ago, I found myself in this muddled, up, um, this muddled up place, Las Vegas, while covering a conference for Las Vegas. It didn't have anything to do with sun. Um, it was a forensic science conference. Um, and I'd spent, I was kind of riddled with jet lag having flown over there and spent several days just locked indoors in this windowless meeting room in this small um, business hotel. And by the end of this, I was just desperate to find somewhere to sit outside and have a cup of coffee in the sun, because it was October, and it wasn't too, I mean, it was hot, but it was that kind of beautiful, dry, crisp heat, and the sun, you know, the sun was out there, there were no clouds, and yet there was nowhere to sit outside. So, I mean, the casino owners in Las Vegas have kind of recognised that the sun has this this phenomenal influence over our body, it, you know, it enables us, for one thing, to keep time. And the last thing you want if you're a casino owner is for people to know what time it is. <laughs> um, they've also realised that actually light and different colours of light can, um, can affect, our, can affect our, our psychology. So, um, for instance, studies have shown that if you pair red light with fast music, 
People will bet faster and they'll take bigger risks with their money. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so as I found, I found myself just walking through these endless um, kind of chains of underground shopping centers, just trying to find somewhere to sit outside. And it was really, really, really difficult. Until I got to the, the resort of uh, Caesar's Palace, which is this, has anyone ever been to Las Vegas? Have you been to uh, Caesar's Palace? So anyone who hasn't been there, Caesar's Palace is this, you know, kind of fantastic mock Greco-Roman empire, mostly underground. <laughs> Um, it's, it's, it's extremely impressive. And as I was kind of walking through there, kind of stumbling moth-like after these days of being shut indoors and my night times out on these casino floors having fun, I saw what I thought was sunlight up ahead and I got very excited. I was like, finally, my search has come to an end. I can sit down and have that cup of coffee and enjoy the sun. And I got there and I looked up and what I saw was not the real sky. It was this vast, really beautiful artificial sky. And as I kind of slumped, defeated, next to this replica of Rome's Trevi Fountain, it just kind of struck me how perverted our relationship with light and dark has become in the modern world. Um, as I said, I'd been, I was working at New Scientist at this time, and I'd been writing a lot about these things called circadian rhythms, which I'll come to later, but they're these 24-hour fluctuations in the, the um, activity of pretty much every biological process, from the most obvious one being when we feel sleepy and alert, but then it also controls things like our brain chemistry, our mood, um, when we release hormones, the activity of our immune cells. So, for instance, our response to the flu vaccine is different. It's, it's more potent if you get the flu vaccine in the morning compared to the afternoon or the evening. Um, and, I, and, and the same year, I think, that I was in Las Vegas, the International Agency for Research on, can uh, on Cancer had just designated shift work, which interferes with these circadian rhythms and, and introduces people to this very different pattern of light and dark. So you're seeing a lot of light at night and a lot of darkness in the daytime. It just said that shift work was a probable human carcinogen. So I was becoming very interested in this, this whole thing. Because... So, uh, circadian rhythms aside, our biology is set up to work in partnership with the sun and this 24-hour cycle of light and dark that we humans, and in fact all organisms, evolved under. Our ancient ancestors didn't only revere the sun from a spiritual perspective, constructing these vast monuments to mark the, the solstices and the turning points in the year. They also revered the sun from a kind of health perspective, point of view. So the ancient Egyptians and Babylonians um, recognised that the sun had these healing properties. They would, they would, particularly for skin diseases, they'd anoint the skin in various herbal balms and, and combinations and expose it, to the, and expose it to the sun. The Ebers Papyrus, which was an ancient Egyptian medical document, talks about how you can, he, how you can relieve pain by exposing the skin to sunlight and warm sunlight. Um, this extended to the Greeks and Romans as well. I mean, they, they kind of built these solaria and advocated sunbathing, actually, as a remedy for all sorts of things, from malnutrition to obesity to asthma. Um, the ancient Greek physician Hippocrates um, was an advocate of sunbathing, but he was also actually the first person to discover this, this thing, melanoma, this deadly skin cancer. And he was, he's also famous for kind of advocating everything in moderation. Um, Hippocrates was actually the first person to document a circadian, rhythms in a circadian rhythm in humans. So he noticed that the severity of fever kind of waxed and waned over the course of 24 hours. So, you know, people, people's fever would get worse and then better and then worse and then better again. And he also recognised that human biology seems to differ slightly according to the seasons. But this interest in light had a kind of a resurrection in the, um, in the 19th century. So this is Florence Nightingale, who, um, who wrote in her notes on nursing that it's the unqualified result of all my experience with the sick that second only of their need for fresh air is their need for light. 
and that after a close room, what hurts most is a dark room. And it's not only light, but sunlight that they want. So Nightingale noticed actually how these patients in these, you know, these hospital wards, um, she was caring for sick soldiers, they would, they would quite often turn their bodies to face wherever the window was, even if lying on that side of their body was painful for them. It was almost like humans have this kind of, they're kind of light-seeking, and they, they are looking for that light source. Um, because I said, as I said, our biology is set up to work with sunlight, actually. So most people would be familiar with, um, with vitamin D and the fact that we produce vitamin D when we're exposed to sunlight, but the sun does other things to us. So not long after Florence Nightingale was advocating for, for sun exposure in hospitals, um, there was a Danish doctor called Neil Svinson who won the Nobel Prize for his work on showing that light could cure tuberculosis of the skin. Um, so the sun has these bactericidal effects. It kills, it kills organisms directly. But then there's the vitamin D story. So, so by the 1920s, in fact, they were kind of starting to get, get to grips with the fact that sunlight um, causes vitamin D production. But at the same time, people were being sent off to these sanatoria to cure things like bone tuberculosis and lung tuberculosis. And we now know that the reason that sunlight therapy worked is that because when, when, when we produce vitamin D, it doesn't only strengthen our bones and our teeth, which is what most people associate vitamin D with. It also, um, it also works with our immune cells. So we have these immune cells that kind of travel all over our bodies, but in the, in the lungs when they encounter pathogens, like the bacterium that causes uh, tuberculosis, they use vitamin D to start spewing out this antimicrobial compound called cathelicidin. So it's not only kind of UV light from sunlight isn't only killing the bacteria on our skin, it's, it's helping our immune cells kill bacteria as well. But the sun does other things to our skin as well. So um, we are... You know, we, we have to worry, we, we do genuinely, I, sorry, I'm losing my chain of thoughts. Um, obviously, too much sun exposure results in the development of skin cancers and, and that, that deadly skin cancer, melanoma. And the reason it does this is because UV light triggers, um, triggers our DNA to mutate. And if those mutations go unchecked, then they can develop into cancer. But another reason why the sunlight can be so harmful is because it suppresses the activity of our immune cells. And our immune cells are another, another way of catching and destroying cancer. So if you get those UV mutations, and then usually your immune cells will recognize these, um, these dodgy cells and, and kill them. But if that activity of those immune cells is being suppressed by too much sun, then they're not so good at, um, at spotting those abnormal cells in the first place. But actually, um, scientists are starting to think now that a bit of sun exposure may be beneficial for our immune systems, and it may actually have evolved as a way of keeping our immune system in check. So there's you know, one disease which is more prevalent at high latitudes, so the further north or south you go, is multiple sclerosis, which is an autoimmune disease. And um, they're starting to think that if you don't get enough sun exposure, that might, um, that might cause the immune system to be more likely to kind of spiral out of control and, and start attacking self, as, which is what happens in multiple sclerosis. And then there's another interesting thing, which is that when we're exposed to sunlight, we get a drop in our blood pressure. So people's blood pressure tends to be lower in summer than in winter. And the reason for this is that when we're exposed to sunlight, we release this substance in our skin called nitric oxide, which causes our blood vessels to relax and get wider. So then you get this drop in blood pressure. So there's a, a dermatologist at the University of Edinburgh called Richard Weller, who recently discovered that being exposed to the equivalent of about 20 minutes of British summer sunlight causes a drop in blood pressure which is enough to be clinically significant, and it's maintained for up to an hour after we step indoors. But as I said, it's not only the skin, and the rest of this talk I'm going to be um, focusing on these things called circadian rhythms. So at the back of the eye, on our retina, behind the rods and cones, the rods and cone cells that enable us to perceive um, 
color and black and white and, and to see, you have this other subset of cells. They have a very long name. Um, they're called intrinsically photoreceptive retinal ganglion cells, <laughs> which is a bit of a mouthful. So from now on, I'm just going to refer to them as light-sensitive cells, but what I'm talking about are these IPRGCs. And these cells are particularly responsive to light in the blue part of the spectrum blue part of the spectrum. They'll respond to any light if it's bright enough, but particularly this blue spectrum light, um, which we find, in, um, we find in many light sources, actually. So you get lots of blue light in daylight, even though, I mean, daylight is composed of light from across the spectrum, but it has blue in there, and sunlight is very bright. So these IPRGCs, or these light-sensitive cells, are very responsive to daylight. But another source of light that contains a lot of blue is the new LED bulbs that you find in ceiling lights and electronic screens. So many of you may have read newspaper headlines or heard news reports recently about having to avoid um, blue light at night because it interferes with sleep. And I'll go into that in a bit more detail in a bit. But these, um, these light-responsive cells in the back of the eye do a few things. They plug into areas of the brain which influence our alertness. So exposure to bright light, like I'm getting in my eyes right now, literally wakes you up. Um, it's like drinking, actually. Being exposed to even quite low-intensity blue light is for, for an hour is equivalent to having several cups of coffee in terms of the kind of the boost in alertness that you get. Those light-sensitive cells also feed into areas of the brain that regulate mood. And we know that, actually, in the case of things like seasonal depression, that exposure to bright light in the morning has a strong influence on mood. It's an, it's an antidepressant. But the other thing these light-sensitive cells do is they, they directly connect to our, our master clock in our brain. It's a very, very small area of brain tissue, about the size of a grain of rice, that, that acts kind of like the body's Greenwich meridian. So in every cell of our body, we have these molecular clocks ticking away, um, driving these circadian rhythms. They actually will tick away in the absence of light, and they control all these things, as I said, from the release of hormones to all sorts of things, like even our grip strength varies over, over the course of the day, our body temperature, our alertness, our bowel movements. Um, and in some people, these, these molecular rhythms are ticking away at slightly under 24 hours, so 23 and a half hours. These people tend to be larks. Um, in other people, they're kind of more like 24 and a half, closer to 25 hours, and those people tend to be night owls. But even though we have these kind of, these genetically predisposed kind of preferences to when we sleep and wake up, um, all of us manage to stay synchronized to the 24-hour day here on Earth. So how do we do that when our rhythms are kind of closer to 23 hours in some people and closer to 25 in others? Well, the way we do it is by the impact of bright light falling on those light-sensitive cells at the back of the eye. It basically acts as a kind of reset button on a stopwatch each day. So it tweaks the timing of our clocks in our, in our master clock in the brain. And, and that then sends signals to all these other clocks, which is how it like, functions as a Greenwich Meridian. It keeps them all synchronized with each other and with what's going on in the world around us. And it enables us to predict regular events in our environment, like, I mean, historically and, and through our evolutionary history, you know, when predators are going to be out about, when it would be a good time for us to knuckle down and hide in a cave, and when, when it's a good time to be out seeking food. Sorry. There we go. So, but in the modern world, you know, we, we, things have been altered. So, so that clock, um, light exposure will act as a reset button, but depending on when we see light, it can push the timing of those clocks forwards or backwards. So light at night tends to shift people later. Um, and... As I said earlier, many of you may have heard about these kind of detrimental effects of looking at tablets or smartphones in the run-up to bed. And, um, and several studies have you know, shown that using these things in the run-up to bed can impact the quality of your sleep. So you tend to get less deep sleep, and your sleep also seems to be less, uh, more fragmented. 
Why is that? Well, for one thing, um, light suppresses the release of this hormone, melatonin, which is under the strong control of the circadian clock. And melatonin basically acts as the body's signal of nighttime approaching. So we start to release it in the evening, and then it kind of ramps up overnight, and then it falls away in the morning. And it, it, it signals to the whole body that it's time to kind of switch gear and start doing the things that the body does at night. Um, like one of the things that it does at night is the brain seems to flush water through its, through its tissue and flush out a lot of toxins, including beta amyloid, um, which is associated with Alzheimer's disease. So, you know, it's an important marker of the night. Um, but when you see bright light at night, even though the body is starting to release it, that bright light will suppress it. So it's, also, it's almost kind of suppressing that kind of nighttime signal. And melatonin is also really important for signaling to the areas of the brain that, um, that control sleep. So it's kind of, when we see light at night, it's almost suppressing those, those kind of sleep signals. So, and, and, then, and then, as I said a minute ago, um, light also directly affects alertness. So if we're seeing light at night, we're feeling less sleepy. We're not getting the, the signal that it's time to, you know, time to gear down and, and go to bed. And we're also feeling more alert, particularly if the light is particularly bright or blue. But it's also pushing our clocks later, so it's making us more night owlish. And that doesn't necessarily matter if you can choose to get up whenever you want the next morning. But if you have to, you know, if you have appointments to keep, if you have to go to work or school or help other people go to work or school, then it can cause your sleep to become shortened. It's also a problem because light at night um, can cause greater inconsistency in the timing of your sleep. So what you really want is to, it's really hard, and I don't do it myself, but I try to, is to go to bed at the same time every night and wake up at more or less the same time each morning. And the reason for that is that if you, you, can, you can move your circadian rhythms, but when you do that, um, and you do that, that's, what, how, that's how you adapt to jet lag and when, you, when you go abroad, but the clocks in all your different tissues don't move at the same rate. So you start to get this kind of circadian desynchrony spreading through the body where the clocks in, say, your liver cells and your brain cells and your muscle cells are not quite in, in synchrony with each other. And you get this thing called, um, well, you, there's this phom phenomenon called social jet lag, which happens when people get up at, at different times on weekdays compared to the weekends, and you get this circadian desynchrony. And um, this thing called social jet lag, which you may have heard of. And in the words of um, a professor called Till Roneberg at the University of Munich, who came up with this term, social jet lag, the more of, you ex the more of it you experience, the, he said, the fatter, dumber, grumpier, and sicker you will be. <laughs> <laughs> so it's important to stay regular. But the thing is, it's not just light at night that's important. Because our daylight exposure also affects the magnitude, the magnitude of these circadian rhythms. So one thing you often find in, in hospital patients or care home patients is that their circadian rhythms, so these 24-hour oscillations in our biological activity, become flattened. So in a healthy person, they'll be like this at night and day. And then if you, if you have a more even exposure to light and dark over light and day, they become kind of flattened and, and desynchronized. And this is important because our light environment in the daytime is also very different in the modern world compared to how it used to be. So illuminance or brightness is measured in this unit called lux. Um, I took these photos and light meter readings outside in, I think it was in December in Bristol where I live. And you can see, you know, even in winter, facing towards the sun, it's about 30,000 lux outside, and facing away, you know, with the sun behind my back, and this is in the morning, you can tell by the length of the shadows, just after I've done the school run, um, it's about 11,000 lux outside. This is a photo taken um, at dusk in the middle of the summer. So you can see kind of just before the sun goes down, it's about 500 lux outside. but indoors it's a very different story. So this first photo is taken in the really bright light-filled atrium of the Gibbs building at the Wellcome Trust 
It's a you know, beautiful, beautiful glass front. But you step you know, four meters away from that glass, and it's already dropped down to about 190 lux, which is similar to the kind of light you'd find in, in many office buildings, actually. Um, the second building is, is, my, is a hotel room I was staying in. Um, I'm standing right next to the window, with the window behind me, looking into the room. It's about 90 lux. And then the next picture is the same room with the curtains shut. 71 lux. Um, before I came out just now, I took a light meter reading of the brightness in this lecture theatre. 35 lux. And, you know, outside on a day like today, which is fairly overcast, it's still probably about um, 5,000 lux outside. So, you know, like 100, 140 times dimmer in here than it is outside. So the message from this really is that we are, we are really spending our days in the biological equivalent of twilight, and we're also lighting up our evenings in a way that our ancestors never did. This, is just, this slide is really just to show you some kind of typical light meter readings. And you can see that in the daytime, you know, it's, 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 it's dim. It's dimmer than it is at sunset outdoors. And in the evenings, you know, in a kind of standard living room, it might be sort of 30 to 70 lux. But then if you get into, you know, the kind of bright kitchens with the bright LED lights in the ceilings or or bathrooms, it can easily get up to 200 lux. And it's very different to the pattern of light exposure that we evolved under. The man we have to thank for all this <laughs> is, um, is Thomas Edison. So up until the kind of early 1800s, people experienced the night the old way, and the only real source of light at night was firelight, or the light produced by burning candles or whale oil lamps. The first big change was the invention of gaslight. But gaslight was still pretty dim. Um, even so, it, it did change people's relationship with the night. The word nightlife actually evolved in um, 1852, because suddenly you had gaslights and people could start spending their evenings window shopping or, you know, things like cafe culture and going to the theatre. These things flourished because suddenly you didn't have to rely on, on dim, dim flames anymore. But the big change came in 1879 when Edison invented the incandescent light bulb. Edison was not a fan of sleep. <laughs> He once quipped that everything which decreases the sum total of man's sleep increases the sum total of man's capabilities. There's really no reason why man should go to bed at all. And of course, electric light has enabled shift work to take off in, in a major way. Um, Edison also said that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Edison was clearly a bit of a genius, but on the subject of sleep, he was wrong. Because sleep deprivation really is deadly, and it can kill us quickly or slowly. Just from a quick point of view, um, driving without enough sleep is deadly. So um, driving on four to five hours sleep has been found to quadruple your risk of crashing compared to if you get seven hours of sleep. But over the long term as well, chronic sleep deprivation has been associated with the onset of Alzheimer's disease, cancer, psychiatric disease. Um, it's also associated with heart disease, obesity, and diabetes. These things, are also, um, these things have also been associated with an increased risk, uh, sorry, shift work has also been associated with an increased risk of these things. And it doesn't just seem to be about sleep duration, but also about circadian disruption. So there was an interesting study which looked at the effect of getting five hours sleep per night um, versus five, five hours sleep per night at regular times versus five hours of sleep per night at irregular times, so changing that five-hour sleep window. Um, and they did this to a group of people over the course of eight days. And what they found in both groups 
was that their sensitivity to this hormone insulin, which enables us to control our blood sugar levels, um, dropped both in both conditions, so when they were not getting enough sleep and when they were get, not getting enough sleep at different times. And levels of inflammation in their bodies also went up. And inflammation is another of these things that seems to be being linked to pretty much every chronic disease that we get. But in the irregular sleep group, so the people who were not getting enough sleep but were also not um, getting that sleep at different times of day, so they were getting this kind of circadian desynchrony, the, these things, so this um, decreased insulin sensitivity and this inflammation, in, both, in both, both of these things doubled. So it was a lot worse if you were getting not enough sleep at different times. And there was another study which, which looked at people who were getting enough sleep. So they were getting eight hours of sleep per night. Um, but again, they were shifting the timing of this sleep um, day by day. And in this study, um, they did this to 10 people over the course of 10 days, and they were kept in a sleep lab, so they didn't go outside. They were just, you know, they could really, really finely control the kind of light exposure these people were getting. And here again, they found that people's, people's insulin um, sensitivity dropped, and their ability to control their blood sugar dropped. And in three of these 10 people, actually, who were previously completely healthy, after just 10 days, three of them had developed the had developed pre-diabetes so their you know their blood sugar control was all over the place so it's an indication that this this stuff matters so you know what would happen if we reverted to a more traditional relationship with light while i was researching my book chasing the sun i had the opportunity to go out to pennsylvania in in america to spend a long weekend with a group of amish people now, the Amish people are interesting because they have... The reason I was interested in them, anyway, was because they have a much more traditional relationship with light. So they don't, they're not allowed to connect to the electric grid, um, not really because they're opposed to electricity per se, but they, they don't like the kind of trappings of modern life that it brings, um, things like the internet and all that kind of bad stuff. Um, but they do have gas lights, so their, you know, their evening light exposure is, um, I've got this next slide shows us, so their average evening light exposure is, is significantly dimmer than we have in the West. This is, this is the kitchen of the house I stayed in, and you can see that big light, that light there, is the, it's a big kitchen because they have big families, um, but they just have that one gas light which lights their whole... Um, downstairs and then they it's on wheels so that box it's standing on is a kind of wheelie box and so they'll they'll eat by the eat, cook and eat by this light and then they'll wheel it into the sitting room and then they'll use that light to um to do their reading or whatever they do in the evening this is changing though so you know traditionally the amish would would just use one gas light and then if they needed to go to the bathroom or anywhere else in the house they'd either use a oil lamp or they would just carry a torch, a battery-operated torch, because they're allowed to use batteries. Um, but these, can you see over on this side, these kind of mushroom things? This is a really new thing, um, and this family had started using them. These are LED lanterns, and they're extremely bright and ferocious. And actually, they produce a lot of blue light. So things are, are changing. But on average, the Amish are exposed to far lower levels of light than we are. And then their daytime light exposure is a lot brighter. And the reason for that is, for one thing, um, they tend, a lot of them still do agricultural work. If even whatever they do, they tend to work very close to home and they're not allowed to drive. So um, they tend to walk or um, they ride these giant, because they're not allowed to use bikes either, so they ride about on these, these giant kind of oversized push-along scooters, like kind of kids' mini micro-scooters, but a kind of giant adult version with um, cycle wheels for the... For the wheel. they're, they're very... I should have put a picture up, because they're <laughs> really interesting. Um, but the Amish are interesting. Um, so I went out to spend some time with the Amish to find out a bit about how they sleep. And in common with other pre-industrial communities that have been studied, so these are people living in tribes in Africa or South America, what you find is that people tend to go to sleep earlier. They tend to go to bed not, not as soon as the sun sets, but earlier than we do in Britain on average. So 
This is also seen in the Amish. So the family I was staying with, um, I asked what time they typically, typically went to bed, and they said, oh, you know, like 8.30 or 9 p.m. And, um, and then in the mornings, they get up at about 4.30 or 5 a.m., which was good for me because I had jet lag again. So, you know, that was, <laughs> that was a bit of a lion for me. Um, but I interviewed a lot of Amish people about this, and, and all of them said, yeah, you know, Amish society kind of gets going at about five in the morning. But there are people who will identify as night owls, even in that society. And there was this woman called Katie Baylor who claims to be one of these night owls. So I said, so Katie, when, do you, when would you like to go to bed if you could? She's like, you know, 10 p.m., that would be great, but my husband won't let me. He wants me to go to bed. <laughs> and, then, and I'm like, okay. Sounds quite early to me. What about getting up? When would you like to get up? And she complained that she had to get up at 5 a.m. to cook her husband breakfast. And she said, oh, you know, I would love it if I could sleep in until 7 every day. That would just be perfect. So, you know, you see this kind of this earliness in this community. Um, so what would happen if we had this kind of this relationship in, in say, urban Bristol? Well, I decided to find out. So this is me three winters ago. Um, I did this experiment with some sleep researchers at the University of Surrey. And we were interested in what would happen if I went cold turkey on artificial light after dark, but also if I tried to get more bright light exposure during the daytime. And the way I did with this was that after 6 p.m., it was in December, so, and I had to work during the day on my laptop. So I went, okay, from 6 p.m., no electric lights, and this also applied to my, my family, and my kids were not so happy about this. But, um, but we're just going to use candles after dark, and in the daytime, even though I have to work in an office, I'm going to do everything I can to get outdoors, little and often, really. So things like, this is me in my local park, doing my Pilates, which I'd usually do in a windowless gym. Um, and, you know, going for a run, going for a walk around the block at lunchtime, eating outdoors, having a cup of tea in, um, in the garden in the morning rather than in my kitchen. These kind of little and often ways of getting more bright light during the daytime. And what we found, even though I was doing this in an urban city in the middle of winter, sorry, that's urban city, of course it's urban. <laughs> Even though I was doing this in the middle of winter in Bristol, what we found was that my circadian rhythm, and we measured this by looking at when I started to release that, that nighttime hormone, melatonin, my circadian rhythm shifted between an hour and a half to two hours earlier each day, so I became more of a lark. And I was also, I mean, it was difficult because I was doing this in, in the run-up to Christmas, so even though I was, I was definitely feeling a lot sleepier in the, in the evenings than I would normally be, um, we had quite a lot of social engagements, and actually we had a lot of friends and relatives who were just quite curious to see what on earth we were doing and what it's like to live without electric light in winter. Um, and it's, it's very nice, actually, although there are certain activities like chopping carrots and onions, <laughs> which are not to be recommended. Um, but what we found, apart from this, was that um, it, wa yeah, it wasn't just the cutting out of light at night that, that had this effect. So even... I did a week where I was just trying to get out more during the daytime. Um, and then, too, we saw this shift towards earlier timing, a more kind of larkishness, if you like. And we also found that the more of this bright light I was exposed to during the daytime, the more sleep I got. And I also felt more... The thing that really, really struck me was that when I was waking up in the morning, usually my kids come kind of bounding into the room at sort of 7.30 each morning and like, it's time to wake up! <laughs> and I kind of, like, kind of pulled out of sleep and, and feel very groggy, this, this sleep inertia. Um, but on the, on the weeks when I was cutting out my light exposure at night and getting more bright light in the daytime, and especially in those, in those bright daylight conditions, I was waking up before my kids were coming in, and I was waking up kind of refreshed and alert and kind of ready to go. And my mood was also more positive when I woke up. Um, so I was kind of doing these, like this whole battery of kind of sleep, uh, sleep diaries and sleep questionnaires and alertness and mood questionnaires. But of course, that's just me. That's just an N of one. Um, but this has been found in other studies, larger studies as well. So the General Services, General Services Administration is like the, U the US's biggest landlord, really. They control 
all the kind of office buildings that are used by the US government. Um, and they were interested in what's the impact of getting more daylight into their offices. So they've been, you know, they've been renovating a lot of their office buildings to put in more windows, and, and they wanted to know, is this actually having an effect on, on these office workers? Do they like it? Is it improving their sleep or anything? And, what they, and so they compared office workers in some of these brightly lit buildings, the ones with lots of daylight, and then some other buildings which were more kind of conventional and, and dimmer inside. And on first glance, and they got these office workers to wear these light meters around their, their necks, so they were measuring how much light they were exposed to over the course of the day, and then looking at their sleep and their mood and all these things. And at first it was not very encouraging, actually, because even in these buildings where they'd spent vast amounts of money bringing more daylight in, once you got a few meters away from those windows, the light was tapering off quite quickly because of things like people pulling the blinds. And in the US, they're very fond of these office partitions, so these are kind of blocking the light as well. But when they compared different individuals according to how much light they were being exposed to, they saw this really interesting thing. So generally, people who were being exposed to high amounts of light during the daytime were taking less time to fall asleep at night, and they were getting more sleep. And it was particularly true of people who were seeing a lot of bright light first thing in the morning. So in this group who were seeing the most light first thing in the morning compared to the ones who were seeing the least light in the morning, it was taking them 18 minutes to fall asleep at night on average compared to 45 minutes. And they were also sleeping for, um, I think it was about 20, I can't read my slides, 20 minutes longer. <coughs> And it wasn't just the sleep, it was also their, their depression scores. And some of this might have been just to do with the fact that they were getting more sleep. But there is, there is this association with being exposed to bright light first thing in the morning and, and, having, and having better mood, which is one reason why it seems to work. bright light seems to work for seasonal affective disorder. It's actually an effective treatment for um, general depression as well. So being exposed to, you know, these, using these sad lights to treat general depression has been found to be as effective as taking antidepressant drugs. So, you know, in summary, I think all of us should be trying to spend more of our daytimes outdoors and dim our lights in the evenings. But what if you can't because you're, you're elderly or infirm or a hospital patient? As I said earlier, hospital patients, you, you, you know, hospitals tend to be characterized by these small windows um, and lights which are kind of switched on overnight as well. So you get this kind of more even light-dark exposure between day and night and you get this flattening of the circadian rhythm. And then it's made worse by the fact that certain drugs, including morphine, also interfere with the circadian clock. And there's even some evidence that, um, that patients... Um, recovering from major um, uh, medical interventions or things like heart attacks, that the ones who are left to recover in a bright room and get a lot of daylight, they tend to, they tend to get out of hospital sooner. Um, I think the evidence is more compelling from animal studies, actually. So there was a, a very kind of scary study actually done in mice recently, which looked at um, if you simulate a heart attack in a mouse that has a disrupted circadian rhythm. So basically, you give a mouse the equivalent of jet lag, and then you tie off their blood vessels to simulate a heart attack. And then you, and then you look at what happens to them over the next couple of weeks, and you compare them with mice that were getting kind of regular light-dark exposure and had normal circadian rhythms. And what you see is that those ones who had disrupted circadian rhythms, just like you see in hospital patients, um, they were getting more scar tissue in their hearts as a result of, um, of the simulated heart attack, and their survival rates were significantly lower. And with this, with this in mind, some hospitals are starting to take light very seriously indeed. So Glostrup Hospital is a hospital in um, Copenhagen in Denmark, and they have been experimenting with this, um, it's called human-centric lighting or circadian lighting. But basically the idea is that you're trying to use electric lighting to simulate what's going on in the world outside. So during the daytime, you have these very bright, intense white lights to try and get it much more like daylight in the rooms. And then as afternoon progresses and evening comes on, you're kind of stripping out that, that blue light 
and making it either amber or, or dark overnight unless the doctors and nurses have to come in to um, do kind of just regular checks or if there's an emergency and they put the lights on, the light that comes on is this kind of amber light. It's not the kind of normal bright, um, bright light that you'd get in a hospital. And they did, they did this study in a stroke rehabilitation ward. Um, so some of the patients who were recovering from strokes were housed in a normal hospital ward with normal, normal hospital lighting and normal amounts of daylight coming in, and other ones were housed in this, this kind of human-centric lighting condition. And what they found was that the ones that were in this, um, this kind of these lights conditions, you saw this strengthening of their circadian rhythm, so it was going from, like, from that to, to more like this. And um, you saw that their levels of tiredness, and tiredness is a common kind of thing that you see in the aftermath of a stroke, they were getting less of this tiredness, especially during the daytime, and they had lower depression scores because depression is another common thing that happens in the aftermath of stroke. The doctor who was running this study, which has now been published, um, said to me at the time that the effect on their depression scores was equivalent to giving them antidepressants. And in fact, you know, they often do prescribe antidepressants to these, these patients. And, so, and, and for the ones who were getting antidepressants, it was, it was, even, it was even greater. Um, and a nurse I was speaking to said that actually in the dementia patients, um, she noticed the effect even more. And she said they just seem to have a better idea about what time of day it is and they're calmer. And that's interesting because, um, because dementia is another area where... Um, researchers are, have kind of made the most, done the most research into this, this, this idea of circadian lighting. So generally, our circadian rhythms change. Actually, our circadian rhythms change throughout our lives. So, as children, we tend to be quite early, kind of um, larkish creatures, and then in adolescence, we shift right the other way and we become really owlish. And <laughs> And then, and then as we get older, we, we kind of drift back the other way. So once we get to retirement age, um, we're, we're much more like little children. <laughs> Which is one reason... So actually, um, some researchers have kind of suggested this might be one reason why we have this, this variation in, in our circadian rhythms, is um, what he calls the poorly sleeping grandparent hypothesis. <laughs> and it's that, you know, that... As you get older, you, you see this distribution throughout, um, throughout society of different ages. And, you know, traditionally, we lived in, in kind of family, extended family groups, and you'd have, you know, a range of different ages living within a community. And this guy was doing the study of the Hadza, who were a group of hunter-gatherers in Tanzania. And what he found was, was that actually, over the course of 24 hours, there's barely ever a time when there isn't someone in this kind of extended family group who's awake. And they don't need to post kind of night watchmen to kind of keep, keep watch over the camp for, for lions or, or other invading um, groups of people because, you know, there's always someone awake. Um, but yes, so, so our circadian rhythms change in when we wake up and when we like to go to sleep with age, but they also tend to become flattened as we get older because our, our, the lens of our eye begins to become more opaque, um, so less light gets through. What that means is that as you get older and age, um, you become less sensitive to the effects of light at night, but you're also less sensitive to the bright light during the daytime, so it's even more important to get outdoors during the daytime and see bright light in the day, um, which is a particular problem if you're in a care home. Um, and actually, in care homes, what you see is, is that um, in your dementia patients, there's this phenomenon called sundowning, where people become kind of more agitated in, in the late afternoon and evening. Um, you get this kind of night waking where people wake up in the night and kind of often have falls because they're confused and disoriented. But you find that these things are far worse in winter and on cloud, especially cloudy days in winter. Um, so what researchers have been doing is looking at what would be the effect if we tried to not necessarily send people outdoors, because that's difficult in, um, if you have a dementia a group of dementia patients, but if we try to get more light into their eyes during the daytime. And in a trial that lasted about three and a half years, um, comparing care homes that introduced these kind of bright lights in their, 
um, in their kind of uh, the places where most people congregated during the daytime, um, compared to care homes with kind of more normal light levels. Um, they found that in the patients who were seeing more of this light during the daytime, it didn't cure their dementia, it's not a cure, but they did see a slower rate of cognitive deterioration. These people were experiencing fewer symptoms of depression, and they had less de deterioration in just their ability to do everyday things like help get themselves dressed. And when they, um, when they combined this kind of bright light during the daytime with giving people melatonin tablets to kind of reinforce that signal that nighttime is coming, um, they found that these people were getting better sleep. Anyway, to conclude really, what I think we need is we do need to get more sun exposure than a lot of us do at the moment. Um, but I would never advocate that we should be going out there and getting sunburn and baking ourselves, not at all. Um, but I do think it's really important to brighten our days and dim our nights. We don't have to go back to the dark ages to do that. We can use electric lighting just a bit more sparingly. So one thing I've done since, um, since my light experiment is I no longer have the, the bright ceiling lights on in the evening. I use just more table lamps. And I've also fitted these smart light bulbs in some rooms, like over my kitchen island, that I can kind of dim down in the evenings and tune out the blue light and make it more orange. <coughs> but I also, do, I also get outdoors a lot more during the daytime. And the other kind of key thing is to try and keep a regular schedule, which is important for your health, but particularly for your sleep. Um, and that is the end of my talk, and I'm very happy to take questions. Okay, thank you very much, Linda. Um, we have time for maybe one or two questions with my lovely people on the microphone. And so if you pop your hand up, and uh, if I can see. Is there some? Oh, yep, there's someone just on the second row on the right-hand side there. And have you got one? Excellent. Those will be our two. Hospital um, high-dependency units are typically lit up like a football stadium 24 hours a day. Um, and I know from experience of friends who've come out of that, they've been very disorientated, mainly, I suspect, by the lighting conditions that they've suffered. Um, is there any possible solution that still gives them good care, but they don't have to be blasted by high-intensity light 24 hours a day? Now, um, recommendations that intensive care units try to dim the lights overnight and increase the light exposure during the daytime. Um, but, it, but it's still quite difficult in a lot of hospitals because they have this problem of, of small windows. But I think definitely dimming the lights at night helps. Um, I mean, if, my, if, my, if, a family, if one of my family members was ever in intensive care or in hospital just generally, I would be putting a, a sleep mask over them at night for sure. Um, but... Researchers at the University of Manchester wanted to do a proper, you know, randomised study of this in intensive care unit patients, you know, putting a sleep... It's a really simple intervention, putting a sleep mask over one group of intensive care unit patients and um, just leaving the other group. And they couldn't get the funding to do it, which I think is incredible because it's such a small thing. But, you know, there's really good reason to think that that would be a sensible thing to do. And if you look actually where it, where it has been studied quite well is in um, premature babies. So you would think that premature babies don't necessarily, well, they don't have strong circadian rhythms really. They, I mean, they start to develop circadian rhythms in the uterus, but they're not kind of, certainly their sleep-wake rhythms, as anyone with um, grandchildren will know, uh, are all over the place for the first couple of months. Um, but if you take a premature baby and you um, you cycle their light exposure so you you make it brighter in the daytime and then dimmer at night what you find is that those babies do a lot better um, and i think we should be doing this with all hospital patients yeah thank you and we had one just up here what can you do for somebody who dreams every night and wakes up like i did this morning and stops my husband from getting up until i finished <laughs> <laughs> Do you mean um, what do you do? What can you do if you wake up a lot at night? Or oh, deep sleep. Well, 
I mean, REM, so you dream during REM sleep, and, and that's really important. It's important to get, and you probably are getting deep sleep and, and REM sleep, but it's, you know, you're getting a lot of dreams, so it's just that you're remember, remembering those dreams. But what, what, you, what you find is that actually, if you're exposed to lots of bright light in the daytime, people, people do get more of that deep sleep. Um, and um, another thing that I think to say about REM sleep, which I think is quite interesting, is that you tend to get more deep sleep towards the first half. So when you fall asleep, you tend to get more of that deep restorative sleep in the first half of the night, and then REM sleep tends to predominate during the second half of the night. So actually, if you're cutting short your sleep, what, what you're often doing is not missing out on the deep sleep, you're missing out on a lot of that REM sleep. And REM sleep isn't just important for dreaming, but um, it helps with the consolidation of me memories. In particular, um, in particular, your um, emotional stability. So a, a major problem with people not getting enough sleep and missing out on that that kind of end bit of sleep is that their emotional stability, their abil ability to regulate their emotions is what suffers. So we all really need to be trying to get as much sleep as possible. I feel like that's a very can. good note to finish on. Um, ladies and gentlemen, if you could give a huge round of applause to Linda Geddes. Thank you.